blessed morning to each and every one. You, the view in public, I welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to our Sunday morning St. Augustine Evangelical Bible service, which is online. Uh, feel free to worship the Lord wherever you are, in your beds, in your couches, at home. Come on, just worship God with me as we continue to magnify his name. Amen. Do 
Jehovah 
let's pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to come before you, Lord, and your throne of grace. In this time of COVID-19, Lord, when there has been a tremendous anxiety and uncertainty, we come to you, Lord, knowing that you are in full control. We thank you for all that you have done and for what you are going to do. Father, at this time, I want to pray for the students among us who will be sitting there at CSEC and CAPE exams during July, Lord. After the preparation that they would have been doing for the last two years, Lord, the interruption over the past three months due to the pandemic would have been really unsettling and demotivating. Father, thank you that the dates for the exams have and the format for the exams have been determined. After the months of uncertainty in the last three months, we thank you that there is now a clear way forward. Father, we pray for peace of mind for the students. We pray for a renewed focus so that they can complete the revision and the other work that has to be completed before exams. For students who may have outstanding school-based assessments, Lord, we pray that they will be able to complete them on time for submission. We also pray that the preparations at the schools will be adequate to allow for physical distancing when doing exams, Lord. We pray that the students will be comfortable doing their exams in this new normal, Lord. We pray for confidence so that they can give their best. And Lord, we thank you in advance for the successes that will come. All these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12 to 29. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter roots grow up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal told his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought blessing with tears. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names were written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to God, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it, that you do not refuse him who speaks if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven at that time his voice shook the earth but now he has promised one more i will shake not only the earth but also the heavens the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that is created things, so that what can't be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire.
Good morning, and we come together this morning for another time of worship, and it's fitting that our message this morning challenges us, let us worship God acceptably. This is actually the culmination of our study in the book of Hebrews, and we all need the encouragement of the book of Hebrews. Our passage today, Hebrews 12 12 to 28, addresses Jewish converts facing persecution for their faith and considering turning back to Judaism. It also speaks to Christian brothers and sisters who are overcome by their circumstances and considering turning away from the faith. It offers encouragement to all those who may have temporarily lost sight of the hope that is before them. And the encouragement comes in, in, in this form. It reminds us all that the life of faith is a long-distance race that requires endurance and perseverance. It's not a sprint. It's a long-distance race. And we are also encouraged by the fact that there is a goal and glorious rewards at the end of the race. But we are reminded by the warnings in Hebrews that there are dangerous, destructive diversions to be avoided. And then, especially in this portion, we are reminded that there is a body of fellow runners to help us along the way. Let's, let's look at Hebrews 12, 12 to 28, and what it has to say. First of all, it places a challenge before us, our walk of faith. It starts off with the words, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. I, I am very sensitive to this. Challenge because I'm going through some knee problems right now. I don't know if it's because I wasn't using my knee enough or I was using it too much, but of late I've having some struggles with my knees. This picture here, this challenge here, continues the imagery from the opening verses or the opening words of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where we are challenged to run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. And this is an illustration of the life and walk of, of faith. Uh, and there are some important challenges in, in there that were picked up a week or two ago by our brother Lindsay. Jesus is our example, the author and perfecter of our faith. The discipline and guidance of the Lord is our legacy. It's one of the things that we... we, we, we look forward to, or we should look forward to, because they are, it's marks of our sonship. Because we are his children, because he loves us, he disciplines and guides us for our good. And then there is the promise of a harvest of righteousness and peace as a goal or end result of this walk. Again, I want to remind you, the walk of faith is a long-distance endurance race. But in participating, there is help, there is healing, and there is hope. The, 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 the words that I read to you about um, strengthening your feeble 
arms and weak knees and so on, actually comes from Isaiah 35, verses 2 to 4. The, the writer, as he does throughout Hebrews, is drawing from the Old Testament, things that they were familiar with, drawing them into their current situation, showing them how they apply. And that's how Scripture works, you know. God has spoken, and the things that he has said to us are relevant to our lives and our situations. And sometimes we just need a little help to see where the relevant portion is and how it applies. In this case, he's drawing from Isaiah 35, 2 to 4, where in the midst of Israel's difficulties, in the midst of Israel's um, separation out, out of the land and so on, God is speaking to them. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with deliverance, with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Our walk of faith has two guarantees in it. God is going to deliver us. He is helping us along the way. And we are also helping each other toward healing and away from disability. These are some of the blessings and challenges in there. The passage also quotes again from the Old Testament. This time from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 to 27, and advises us to stay on course. These verses say, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Delays and discouragements arise when we allow ourselves to be led off course by distractions. And there are so many distractions around us in the world. But we are supposed to keep our gaze ahead, fixed. In fact, the earlier portion of Hebrews tells us to fix our attention on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So there's an encouragement to walk, the challenge before us. But there's also a finish line. I want to jump now to the end of the passage. Then we'll go back and look at the middle. But we jump into the end of the passage now. There's a finish line. The finish line is fellowship with God in his kingdom. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, kingdom that cannot be shaken, cannot be changed, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Our walk of faith, the race that we are in, has an unchanging pathway and an unshakable, unchanging destination. We're talking about walking along with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ into a closer fellowship with God the Father our Creator. Let us give thanks to God for His goodness. Let us worship acceptably according to God's word, according to God's will. Let us show reverence and awe for His grace and His power. For our God, the passage tells us, is a consuming fire. The picture here is of power out of control. You remember those forest fires in California last year and in Australia. What did everybody do when they were faced with those fires? You left the area because you knew that it was out of your control. You, you could not control it. We need to understand that we do not manipulate God. God is not under our control. God is outside of our control. We are his children. We are the ones who are to submit to him. We need to walk with him in an awareness of the reverence and the awe that, we, that is due to him. The thing about this finish line is that it also speaks of the, 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 the pathway. This fellowship with God, this growing uh, intimacy with God is our ongoing experience as well as our ultimate goal. 
So we are growing in the awareness of and the reality of an intimate fellowship with God. So, we know the challenge before us, the walk of faith. We know the destination, fellowship with God in His kingdom. Let's talk a little bit about the distractions along the way. Let's deal with the distractions. And this involves critical choices that we have to make along the way. The passage warns us at the beginning, Pursue peace and holiness. Be holy, for I am holy. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Verse 14 of our passage. The principle of the Old Testament priesthood and the sacrifices and all that was given to Israel to guide their walk in a covenant relationship with God. At the heart of it, was the repeated statement in the book of Leviticus, Be ye holy, for I am holy. This speaks of our commitment to serve God, our separating of ourselves unto God, our giving priority to the things of God. As I've expressed it at different times in our study of Hebrews and other people have, it's that vertical relationship in our lives which is important and which so many people neglect. Our vertical relationship needs to be given attention. It needs to be given priority. We also thought to avoid bitter rebellion and strife. Do not miss out on the grace of God. The reference there is drawn from Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18. A bitter root growing up to cause trouble and defile many. And the warning is, do not allow situations to, to simmer and to, to settle and to, to turn into bitter attitudes in your life. Deal with relationship problems. Deal with misunderstandings. Sometimes people even get bitter against God. Things happen in a different way to what they would have expected or what they would have desired. And they blame God. They get bitter against God. They want to turn away from God. Um, I'm reminded of a poster that I bought for my mom and stuck it up in her, her home. It's just reminding us that it, it's just another one of our illusions that we, we have to give up on. The fact is God is out of our control. God is sovereign. He is supreme. We have to deal with it. We have to deal with it. But He's loving. He's good. He's caring. Look for his good hand in the middle of the difficult times. So avoid bitter rebellion. Instead, let's move towards confession, forgiveness, humility in our relationship with God and with others. And then beware of sexual immorality and godlessness. And the example here is the example of Esau. Esau did not value his spiritual inheritance. He was a descendant of um, Israel, the head of the um, nation, and he was entitled to a double portion of his father's um, property and everything that his father represented. But he didn't value that. So he um, sold it to his brother for a bowl of soup. And I like soup too, but you could overlike soup. You could overlike the things of this world. You could let them distract you from the things of God. You could let the horizontal realities distract you from your vertical relationship. What this world offers cannot compare to our heavenly rewards. We need to beware of sexual immorality which draws us aside and, and, and totally um, messes up our lives, gets us tied up in all sorts of weird situations that, that are difficult to resolve. And sometimes so mar our lives that even the opportunities for service, we find ourselves um, debarred from it. In all of these warnings in this passage, there's a subtle reminder that this is not just warnings, you don't do this, you don't do that. It's an encouragement to us as a body to look out for those around us. 
Reminders of the need to look out for one another, to be our brother's keeper in these matters. To encourage one another in the pursuit of holiness. To work with one another in avoiding um, rebellion and bitterness. In challenging one another to keep away from sexual immorality and godlessness. Looking out for one another. Then the passage moves on to what I think is the highlight of the book of Hebrews. A comparison of the Old Testament covenant and the New Covenant. The covenants compared. And the writer goes into this comparison to make a very significant point. Sinai, Mount Sinai in the Old Covenant, represented laws that judge and condemn. The giving of the law was a terrifying experience. Even Moses trembled with fear. It was a pity of darkness and gloom and storm, thunder and an unapproachable mountain on fire. The people were scared when God spoke to them in an overwhelming voice, trumpeting his commands. They said, Moses, you go and talk to him. If we listen to him, we'll die. Go and talk to him, hear what he has to say and come back and tell us. The laws demanded, they were demanding laws and sacrifices associated with this covenant. But the picture of the new covenant is a totally different picture. Zion and the new covenant represent grace that welcomes and unites. We're given the picture of thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, a time of worship. The church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. The spirits of righteous men made perfect. In God's presence, without fear, worshiping and rejoicing. Access to God, our judge, through Jesus Christ, our mediator. The blood of a better covenant. This picture is very similar to Revelation chapter 4 where we get the pity of worship in heaven, with the throne and the lamb and the angels are wrong and the, um, all the nations assembled. And it's a reminder to us that God is calling us into fellowship with himself. He's calling us into a relationship with himself. He's calling us into joyous assembly and worship in his presence. As we walk along, as our ultimate Destiny as our ultimate goal. At the end of the race, at the end of the age, the passage tells us both heaven and earth will be shaken. Things will be shaken up. Things will be changed and transformed. God has spoken. We need to hear his word and to obey his voice. God will judge he will shake heaven and earth. Our only hope is to be among the unshakable. And who will be among the unshakable? The people of his kingdom. The people who have a relationship with him. Who he has said, I will maintain that relationship. Who is in the palm of my hand, no one can take him out. We can stand firm when he shakes again. Our God is a consuming fire beyond our control. He demands our worship. He requires a lifestyle that honors him with reverence and awe. He alone determines what is acceptable. In the light of our coming to the close of our study in Hebrews, it is good to go back and look again at the warnings of Hebrews because these are an overview of the kind of obstacles that we face along the way that affect or hinder our acceptable worship to God. The letter gives us five warnings against neglecting God's word. Let us be people of God's word. We want to know what he has said. We want to heed what he has said. We want to respond appropriately to what he has said. Hardening our hearts, which means that we have heard, but we're not going to do anything about it. We're going to ignore it. Settling for immaturity. We good here. I good just so. 
Not going any further. No, God has called us into this walk of faith. And he wants us to walk. All right? I remember our pastor Francis has this illustration he uses that I love a lot. He says there are two kinds of Christians. There's the pillars and the caterpillars. The pillars hold up the church. And the caterpillars just crawl in and out and all around. Let's be pillars. Let's be effectively serving and fulfilling God's will. Growing on from immaturity into full maturity and ability to serve. The next one challenge is against willful disobedience. In chapter 10, we know what is right, but we choose to do what is wrong. And then finally, chapter 12, bitterness of spirit that rejects God's grace. The answer to all of them is found in Hebrews chapter 12, right at the beginning. Keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, we can avoid the obstacles and worship God acceptably. Amen. glory and grace.
on the first Sunday of each month, we join together in communion, another act of worship where we declare again our commitment to serving the Lord and following his commands. Because Jesus himself said on, on the day of his last supper with his disciples, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I want to let you know that communion is not our domain. We, we, we do not control the communion. It's not our communion. It's a communion with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So once you've committed your life to him, you're free to join with us and participate. And the last, next point I want to remind you is that this is not a time to find reasons not to fellowship, to find reasons not to commune, to find reasons not to join in and come together. These are times to straighten out whatever problems you may be seeing that might prevent you from participating. So we want to start with a time of silent prayer where we ask God to forgive us and to accept us because that is what he died for, so that we may be forgiven, so that we may be accepted in his presence, and so that we may fellowship with him and with each other. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us as demonstrated on the cross. Thank you for your forgiveness and your cleansing and restoration so that we may have fellowship with you and productive relationship with you and with each other. Bless this time of communion as we remind ourselves of all that you have done for us and all that you continue to do for us and the path of faith, the walk of faith that you draw us along into a closer relationship with yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray now for his broken body which was broken so that we may have access through his body to the Father. Let us pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your body that was shed for us, O oh God. Lord, that was beat, O oh God. We know that you went through so much. But Lord, we thank you for this bread, O oh God, that represents your body, O oh God. And Lord, we pray that it would truly remind us of you and your sacrifice, O oh God. We thank you for doing what you did. In Jesus' name, amen. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Let us pray for his blood that was shed for the forgive forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks, O Lord, this morning for the precious blood of Jesus, which brought us our pardon and cleansing. Lord, we know that Jesus' blood could have cried out from the ground for justice like Abel's blood, but instead, it cries out for peace and for reconciliation. And we thank you this morning that that reconciliation is ours, bringing us many, many blessings and benefits. So Lord, as we take the symbol of your poured out blood, help us, O oh Lord, to take it with gratitude and understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let us drink together as he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood 
do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a whole history, a whole background going all the way back to the deliverance of Israel at the Passover that is represented and commemorated in this cup. And it goes forward, it looks forward into Christ's return when he says, I will not drink of this um, wine, of the vine, until I drink it together with you. Pictures of communion, pictures of fellowship. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit. So we thank you for being part of the St. Augustine online ministry. We want to thank the worship leader. We want to thank the speaker. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, this occasion. We continue to trust you for your blessing, for your grace, for your protection. And ask, Lord, that all that we do, we will lift you up. Continue to be with us at such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>